Hi there, and welcome to this week's video. This week we're going to look at focus stacking, and why not? But first of all, what is focus stacking? If you've ever seen images of insects' eyes, dragonflies, houseflies, whatever else, and the detail is incredible, you can see every individual little lens that makes up that compound eye, that was focus stacking. So why do we focus stack? Why not just take the photo? Well, it's all down to depth of field. When you focus your camera, or indeed your eye, on one particular point, that is the sharpest point, the whole point of focus. However, there will be some elements of that closer to you, nearer if you wish, that are also acceptably sharp. And there will be some elements further away from you that are also acceptably sharp. There will always be one absolutely prime sharp point but there's a range of acceptable sharpness values, and that is what we call depth of field. If we use a wide open aperture, an f2.8 or something like that, we get plenty of light coming to the camera. That's great for our shutter speed and our ISO settings, but it's awful for depth of field, because the wider we have the aperture, the f2.8s and the like, then the depth of field can really come down in, in macro realms to be literally a millimeter or two. So the answer, of course, is to shut the aperture right down, go to f11, f16. Uh, much beyond that, you start getting distortion and, and chromatic aberration issues. So we, we go down and we say, right, let's go f16, and let's, let's do that. And that will increase the depth of field, which is amazing. That's what we want. However, you'll appreciate from f2.8 up to f16 is a lot of f-stops. And that, in turn, means that you are losing a lot of light. Now, of course, we could put the ISO up to gain some of that back. So this is a, a dancing routine, if you like, between having a low enough ISO to keep a really good noise-free, or at least noise-acceptable image, a high enough shutter speed to freeze the action, and a tight enough aperture to get everything in focus. And like everything else in life, it is a balancing trick. I went out the other morning, and I found a rose that had made the bad mistake of deciding to bud when we had frost. So I have on screen now three images that I took that morning. So you see here I have image one with my happy smiley hand of this lovely rosebud complete with some frost on it. If I zoom in just a couple here, you will see that it's actually quite pleasant over here. Uh, I appreciate that this isn't the most pristine image ever, it's to, to demonstrate the technique. But moving further back, we've really not got any detail over here. And it possibly was around a centimetre, two centimetres away from this first image. You can understand why depth of field is such a problem. This, by the way, was shot at f10, 400th of a second at uh, 560 ISO to, to get everything sort of where I wanted it to be. And although it's quite still out, this was moving slightly, just very, very slightly. But when you've only got millimetres to play with, slightly is a lot. So shot from a tripod, shot with timed shutter release to get rid of all the possible shakes. So we're, we're quite nice over here. It's kind of lost it a bit over this bit here. And over the background, we've really lost it. But it's also quite pleasant in this bottom left corner. So if we go and look at the next image, and we'll go and zoom in a couple of times there for you. Oops, that should do nicely. We're now really very nicely sharp over here. This is looking really very good. It's quite good up in this top corner. And if I move down a little, if I go get my hand command, and move down a little, we're starting to get some sharpness around the leading edge over here. So we're now getting the image over here where this is quite nice and sharp. Uh, that's not, this isn't, through to the middle image where this is now getting quite nice and sharp. We're getting some sharpness over here. And onto the final image, if I zoom into that for us, you will see that we have some quite nice sharpness developing over here, which is where we want it to be. But of course, the nearest point has, has kind of lost it. Now, the trick we're going to use today is photos, shops, stacking. I'm going to make these all the same size, so we know what we're talking about here. So I've got Control Zero, and Command Zero if you're on a Mac. Tricks you need to know. Number one, remove the lock. So unlock all of the images because we need to move them around. 
So I just select each image and just click on the little padlock symbol and they're now unlocked. Photoshop doesn't really care what order you do this in, but I'm now going to use my move tool and I'm going to select my second image and I'm going to shift and drag that on top of my first image. And by holding down the shift key, when I let go of the mouse key, that will drop that absolutely in the center. Now the image will be slightly different because it's a different focal point, but the frame size, the 6000 by 4000 of my camera, will be central. So I go pick up the third image using the same technique. So we shift, we drag, up over to the new one, drop it down in here, let go of the mouse button first, and we've now got our three images stacked together. And as I move through these, if I turn these layers off, you'll notice the size of that rose changes very, very slightly as we move through the image. And that's, of course, because we've moved the focal point between each image, so it's a different size. That's what happens. What we're going to do now is use Photoshop's ability to stack these images together. Now, of course, if we just put these on top of each other and did this manually, then we would have different image sizes between the three layers, and that's not going to work. But Photoshop can help us. If we now go and shift click over here and we have all three of these layers, then we can go into a edit and auto align. And because this was shot on a tripod, and I'm not that worried about vignette removal because I'm going to crop it anyhow. And I'm not that worried about geometric distortion because it's a flower. There are no straight edges to worry about. I've sorted out chromatic aberration in my opening sequence, part of my workflow. I'm just going to accept the auto setting. And this is now going to auto align the layers. And around the very edges, you'll notice if I zoom in, you'll notice even as I zoom in, uh, a little checkerboard background area where it has done its best to line the images up and let's just zoom in for you but there are some areas where it hasn't quite worked if i turn off some of these layers you'll just about see around the edge here where it said okay mate i've, I've made this a different size for you uh, but the downside of that is we've got some some area that's not used i'm not too worried about that i could have chosen to do something about that with one of the earlier settings but i'm, I'm not bothered i'm going to crop it anyhow so all three are now lined up. What we're then going to do is go back to our edit command and we're going to go auto blend. Now auto blend is going to give us a choice here and we can do a panoramic so we can stitch a whole load together. That works in both directions by the way. Or we can choose to stack which is what we want to do now. So we've got a stack of images that we want to output to one other image. Seamless tones and colors is always good to select. And down here, Content Aware Fill would, if we ticked it, have a good guess at getting rid of those sort of checkerboard bits that I showed you earlier on. Not bothered, going to crop it anyhow. So if we go OK now, Photoshop is going to look at those three images and work out which part of which image is sharp, and it will create automatically for us a layer mask, which will then show up on the right hand side. If you wanted to go mad at this, you could use photo stacking software. Uh, I've got Helicon Remote, which is a, a fantastic piece of gear that will allow you to do loads and loads and loads, and you just set it up on a tripod. You set the nearest and the furthest points, tell it how many photos you want, press click, and then go away and have a brew whilst it sorts it out. But for this nice, simple series of three, I've just taken three images. As you can see now, we have got this in the screen, and on our right-hand side, we have got a series of layer masks. So each one of these represents a piece that Photoshop has used to create, uh, create the final image. So if I take off that layer mask, you can see that's what we've created there. So we've used a fair bit from that first one. If I go and take the second one off, and you can actually see that Photoshop has created three separate masks for us. So we've got that bit from one of them, and that bit from another, and that bit from the third and if we put them all together what we get is a pleasing image that's got the best of all of them because it's just a brief video I'm going to layer flatten those uh, real world I'd probably work on those individual layers a little bit more but having done that now if I zoom in you should see all being well and I say this wasn't a perfect image to start with that I've got a rather nice all-over image 
So I've got my nice sharp-ish ice crystals there. Uh, this, by the way, is quite large. It's 60 odd percent on the screen now. And if I move over to here, then we've got some nice crisp sharpness over here as well. And moving further down to that bottom corner, we've got some nice crispness along this edge here and down in that very bottom corner. So if I control zero back to that, and that is how focus stacking works. You can have automatic procedures, you can do it, I dare say, many, many different ways. It's Photoshop. If it works, it's great. So one thing I did notice, and this is the lovely thing about macro that I really enjoy, is when you look at the image 100% to make sure nothing's gone badly wrong, and that is worth doing. Sometimes there will be bits where it doesn't quite work, there will be little, little glitches, so please do take the time to 100% the image. Uh, but I did this earlier on for my own benefit. I had a zoom in down here, and I zoomed and I zoomed and I zoomed, until I got to 200%. And there is one of nature's little critters doing its best to find a home. So the world of macro is a wonderful place. Um, enjoy it, basically. It is good fun. Um, you can learn a lot from it. Take your time. Don't rush. Usual rules apply. If you like it, it was a great image. If somebody else likes it, even better. And if somebody else likes enough to want to buy it, well, that's out and out fabulous. Hope you've enjoyed this brief video. I'll be another one along, hopefully, uh, towards the end of the week, beginning of next week anyhow. In the meantime, stay safe out there. Look after yourselves. 